Hi everyone, welcome to another Doug's Live video. In this video, I'll be going over the basics of a chlorine generator, as well as some tips and tricks on drying gases. This right here is a basic chlorine generator. It's a pressure equalizing addition funnel, a small flask, and a means to take a gas off of the small flask. Typically, chlorine is generated by the addition of hydrochloric acid to either manganese dioxide, TCCA, or trichloroisocyanuric acid, or some other hypochlorite like calcium hypochlorite. The solid chlorine generant typically sits in the flask down here, and the hydrochloric acid sits up here in the addition funnel. And by turning the stopcock, the hydrochloric acid is allowed to fall onto the generant, which generates chlorine gas. It's important that you have a pressure equalizing addition funnel because the pressure generated by the chlorine gas being delivered to the experiment could exceed the pressure in the headspace above the hydrochloric acid in the addition funnel, which would cause bubbling up through the stopcock. This can be problematic because at first no hydrochloric acid will fall, and then suddenly too much hydrochloric acid will fall, which will cause the generation of too much chlorine. And this can be problematic, of course, because it'll blow joints apart, it'll ruin the experiment, or even worse, blow a lot of chlorine gas out into the room. Before we start, I'd like to say first that if you attempt this, be very careful. Chlorine gas was used in World War I as a poison gas to kill troops, and it is a deadly gas in high concentrations. So unless you know exactly what you're doing, please do not try this at home. So to construct the chlorine generator, we'll first build the apparatus, of course, that's already done, and then we're going to charge the reactants into the, into the generator. So here I have HTH brand pool shock, and you can see chlorine is nasty, it corrodes the crap out of everything. This is 52% calcium hypochlorite, and we're gonna use this. I would usually measure out stoichiometric amounts. However, this is just a demonstration, so I'm gonna eyeball it. So we'll take off the gas adapter here, and we can use this hole to charge the flask with the hypochlorite. I prefer to use a funnel when charging solid reactants into a flask because it prevents granules from sticking inside the joint, which cause problems when inserting the other mating joint. So I've cut a small corner off this bag. And it's sort of a slightly greenish granular substance. I, I believe it's got uh, sodium carbonate in it as well. Maybe some calcium carbonate, I'm not quite sure. But that should be sufficient for today's demonstration. We'll roll this back down. Remove the funnel. It already stinks like chlorine in here. Attach our gas takeoff port and secure it with a clip. The next step is to charge the hydrochloric acid into the addition funnel. You want to make sure that your stopcock is turned off because if you start generating chlorine immediately, you're going to have problems. So I'm going to pour some hydrochloric acid into this beaker. I'm just using some technical grade muriatic acid. It's like $6 in the hardware store. Pretty straightforward. HCL vapors are also pretty nasty. Pour about 100 milliliters. And we'll pour this in. Make sure you're wearing safety goggles when you're using your hydrochloric acid. It's quite dangerous. You can see it's fuming in the water vapor that's in there. There we go. And insert the stopper. And because this apparatus will be pressurized, we also need to secure this with a clip. Perfect. Chlorine generator is now set up. So, I have this one liter Erlenmeyer flask here that we will proceed to fill with chlorine. So I'll stick this tube into the Erlenmeyer flask and you can see the tube is simply coming from the chlorine generator. Okay, so the chlorine generator is primed. I will now turn on the fume hood and start the generation of chlorine. I apologize if that's loud. So I'm going to turn the stopcock and slowly allow the hydrochloric acid to drip onto the calcium hypochlorite. 
And you can see the bubbling already happening on the surface there. And that flask, I tried putting it against a white background so that you might be able to see it turning green. Using a white piece of paper, you can tell that the flask, the gas in the flask is definitely green. I'll use the white piece of paper against the flask there so we can tell when it's filled with chlorine gas. Now, unless you're using ventilation like I have, which is very strong ventilation, you definitely do not want to do this experiment indoors when the top of this flask is just open to the air because you will be getting a significant amount of chlorine in the room. You can see the green slowly filling up the flask. And slowly but surely our flask fills with chlorine gas. I think we're just about reaching the top of that flask now. Maybe a little longer. I am going to turn off the drip of hydrochloric acid to slow the chlorine generation gradually to a stop. And I'll give this a minute to get to equilibrium before taking the tube out of the flask. So I'll now remove the tube and just put a watch glass over our flask and I'll take this, the end of this tube which is still giving off a little bit of chlorine and put it somewhere high up where it can vent. So now you can see, if I put this flask up against a white wall, we have a flask filled with chlorine gas. Wet chlorine gas, but chlorine gas. So here I have crumpled a small sausage-like shape of aluminum foil and I have a propane torch with me and I'm going to heat the aluminum foil to get over the activation energy of this reaction and then rapidly drop the foil into the flask where the aluminum should ignite in the chlorine forming aluminum trichloride very rapidly. Aluminum trichloride is a solid so it'll be in the form of white smoke. I'll turn the lights off so the demonstration looks a little bit better. So I've dimmed the lights a little bit I will now heat the foil and drop it rapidly into the chlorine. You see the exothermic reaction beginning, filling the flask with a white smoke of aluminum trichloride. And using up the chlorine. Something else you should have around whenever you're working with chlorine is a spray bottle with a solution of sodium hydrogen carbonate in it. Spraying this into the air will significantly reduce the amount of chlorine smell by turning some of the chlorine into sodium chloride and sodium hypochlorite. I've prepared another flask of chlorine to demonstrate this. When I spray this bottle of hydrogen carbonate solution into the chlorine, the chlorine will be neutralized into a green solution of mostly sodium chloride and sodium hypochlorite. The green color will slowly start to fade. And then the bottom will remain a green solution of sodium hypochlorite. You can see not all of the chlorine has been totally neutralized but it definitely helps when you're disassembling apparatus to spray this around. And there, most of the chlorine has been neutralized. And you can see by the effervescence of the liquid inside that the hydrogen carbonate is being converted into carbon dioxide, sodium chloride, and sodium hypochlorite. 
Now that I've got the chlorine generator put away, let's talk about drying gases. In the laboratory, many gases are dried using what's known as a drying tube. This and this are both drying tubes. A drying tube is used like this. A piece of glass wool is inserted and pushed all the way to the bottom, where it rests right about there. And then solid desiccant, such as calcium chloride, which is what I've used to dry chlorine in this instance. But other things can be used, like magnesium sulfate, potassium sulfate. There's lots of desiccants. Anyway, the solid desiccant would be put in on top of the glass wool, where it would sit, and the glass wool would prevent it from coming out of this tube down here. And then a stopper with a piece of glass tube through it, like that, would be inserted into that end, and that completes the drying tube. So essentially what happens is gas comes in through this tube and then runs through the desiccant where the desiccant absorbs the water from the gas and then the dry gas comes out there and can be used for an experiment through a suckback trap, preferably, so that none of the experiment gets sucked back into the drying tube in case there are fluctuations in pressure in the apparatus. This right here is an example of a suckback trap. It's just an Erlenmeyer flask with two different lengths of tubing in it. Now, a suckback suck back trap doesn't necessarily have to have one long piece of tubing and one short piece of tubing. You can also have two short pieces of tubing, but this also doubles as a gas drying apparatus because I could, for instance, put solid desiccant into this and then wiggle this tube down through the desiccant. And as long as I fed gas into the long tube, where it would go all the way to the bottom and then travel up through the desiccant, I could get dry gas out the top. So this has a dual function. It can be a gas dryer or a suckback trap. Further, this right here is also an example of a gas drying apparatus. It's fairly simple in its construction. You have a 50 milliliter round bottom flask connected to a vacuum adapter, which is connected to a thermometer adapter, and a piece of glass tube in place of a thermometer. Now to load it, you remove the thermometer adapter. Leaving the glass tube in, you charge your solid desiccant into the top, where it fills up to about here. Or you can use a liquid desiccant, like sulfuric acid, in which case you would charge it up to about there. And then you simply put your thermometer adapter back on, thread the o-ring down, and then cinch it to trap the glass tubing and perform and provide a nice tight seal. So of course gas is fed in the top, where it travels down the tube, bubbles through the liquid desiccant, or past the solid desiccant, and then comes out this tap over here. The same is true for this apparatus here. If I was drying with sulfuric acid, for instance, a larger volume of chlorine gas, I might use something like this, where I could put a significant amount of sulfuric acid up to 250 milliliters in this flask to dry it. Or I could use this apparatus still, but just replace the round bottom flask on the bottom with one of a larger size. So that's about all I have on gas drying. and course the generation of chlorine gas. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, thanks for watching.